Welcome to the Found Cause. We're found our cause and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Michael Bayman behind the machine, and to my right is Sebastian, the bookkeeper. And all the way across the airwaves, it's Theodore under the PC under the person of Christ. You know, and Theodore is a like the marketing brain behind our whole podcast because he comes up with some killer episode ideas. And although our last episode was a was a the uh, was a Sebastian brainchild, which did really well, um, Theodore is behind like seven out of the ten of our top performing videos. Uh, he knows this, and that's why he only comes on when he wants us to make a big splash. <laughs> so we thought, Theodore, you've been around from the very beginning of the podcast, and although you're not on every episode, you are the one of the OG members, um, and we've never done a testimony podcast with you, and you have like a really unique testimony. Me and Sebastian did uh, testimonies before, um, and every testimony is unique in some way, but we thought it was about time to do you. So that's what this episode is, is testimony of Theodore. But to keep it spicy and to keep it interesting, we all know that Theodore is a writer, and so he's written out a large, large explanation of his testimony, which is what makes sense. But we want to keep it it's spicy page. and make sure that Sebastian and and me have uh, something to, to say. So we're going to prompt the questions. Um, 678 words. Okay. So it's not that big. He's defending himself. Uh, it's a good testimony. So it may or may not be a short um, episode, but it's Theodore's life story. So we're going to we're gonna pull up the highlights. So Theodore, unless you've got any extra input, Sebastian. No, I don't want to hear it. Okay. Without further ado, Theodore, give us like a preface, the big high level, 30,000 foot view of why your testimony is interesting. All right. Well, I was in a South Korean cult. Uh, popularly called Providence, and a not fun fun fact um, is that South Korea has a lot of cults, and I've talked about issues uh, with some of their interpretations and how they, or the specific one I was in, I um, how they try to spiritualize and reinterpret um, a lot of scripture. And one video on this channel I made was a response to one of the their pastor's YouTube channels. And if you want to watch that, it's called Espresso with Sky, Interpretations from Creation to the Second Coming, which basically gives a few examples of how they diminish the statements of Scripture and deny the miracles of Jesus, which results in them believing in their own Korean Jesus, who claims to be the Second Coming, who teaches a higher level word and salvation, a higher level salvation than the one the real Jesus brought. Uh, because, spoiler, they don't believe Jesus was God. Um, or is God. And if you really want to know the current um, status of the cult and crimes of the leader, and these are currently alleged um, because it's re he was put in prison before for 10 years, mm. so that's not really alleged. But uh, this one is um, he's currently going to court again for similar crimes since he's gotten out like three, three to five years ago. Um, and if you want to watch more about that, um, there's a documentary recently done by an Australian news and YouTube channel, which is Seven News Spotlight, titled The Cult Next Door. So, I mean, that right That's there, I mean, it's going to, I don't know how I'm going to headline it for our video title, but like you being in the South Korean cult, like I'm probably the most into anime of all three of us. And Sebastian's <laughs> the most like you know, exotic, uh, <laughs> if I can say that. That's probably awful. Yes, yes, you can. The most non, um, you know, he's got the most world experience between the three of us. He also goes to Europe all the time. Um, but you were in the South Korean cult. Um, what Me, are, a traditional white man. I know, a traditional white man in the South Korean cult. Yeah. Like, do you even watch anime? Um, is that no. <laughs> K-dramas? Um, that, that's oh, just... I did watch a little. You Just kidding. Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> Keep so going. you did watch a little when you were there. Um, little Yu-Gi-Oh! Oh, Yu-Gi-Oh. Well, it is Japanese, so I don't think this is fair. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. So all that said, it was serious. Like, you really were in this. This wasn't like a joke that you pretended to be in the South Korean cult or whatever. Like, you legitimately were. Um, this is a major part of your testimony. So, Four as, or five years, yeah. Yeah, and as God is apt to do, he makes interesting stories, even out of um, mundane white men. So <laughs> I being one of them. <laughs> so let's talk origins. I feel like everybody's testimony needs the full origin story. So, like... Who are your parents? Where'd you come from? Before before you get to that, I want to I want to I want to ask: Did you say that you once were you appeared on their website? Like they took a picture of you and you were on their Providence website, or no? Or am I misremembering? Oh, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, possibly, but I don't think so. 
Okay, never mind. Must be misremembering then. You, they have photos of me, <laughs> most likely. Okay. Probably been on video once, but. Okay, we'll find you then, and verify that I'm not hallucinating. <laughs> I don't know that I want. Might to be pretty difficult, but. Say, yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Origins. Mm -hmm. Origins. Give me the origins. All right. Um, so the brief origins are my mom grew up Baptist. My dad grew up Mennonite. And they came together and raised my siblings and me in a Lutheran church and school from kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, Here in Minnesota, yeah. And uh, my siblings joined this cult around the time I was in eighth grade. Eventually came back home and told our family about it. And I was then in my first or second year of high school um, and was the youngest in my family and most impressionable and wanted to look up to, to that sibling. And anyway, felt like I was missing something or like there could or should be a more meaningful purpose than I, what I perceived my life um, to have at that time or in other people's lives, even Christians' lives. Yeah. And can I, so. can I um, interject there and say, so you went from kindergarten to eighth grade. Did you, do you remember like how your relationship with religion, with God was growing up Lutheran? Oh yeah. I thought it was really good. Um, and Luther's small catechism, we went through that. I went through confirmation. Remember trying to evangelize somebody on the school bus, school bus in elementary school. Um, yeah, I was just a basic, I guess more or less obedient, uh, Christ, uh, Christian school raised Dane white boy. <laughs> yes, yeah, whatever. Yes, we we know we know we're all white boys. Um, the yeah, what kind and what kind of kid were you? Were you like a, a shy guy, a sports guy? Like if you had to call yourself, what kind of kid were you made? Uh, more so shy or reserved. Okay. Sports, but yeah, still shy and reserved. And you're the youngest. Did you feel like you were in anybody's shadow or? Um, I actually kind of uh, appreciated being in my uh, th brother three years older. I appreciated being in his shadow because mm -hmm. <laughs> he was a good, he is a good guy, peace, peaceful, peacemaker guy. And he was the, I guess the, smarter person in our family or the smartest of us siblings mm -hmm. so i was and being shy or reserved i was just fine being known as his brother um because i didn't really want to have any more attention on me it was just i guess good to be noticed a little bit not too much okay so you kind of enjoyed you didn't want to be totally forgotten of course who wants that but uh you enjoyed having somebody else take some of the heat, which is what older siblings do usually. Mm -hmm. He went to high school one year, or we had one year overlap in high school, mm -hmm. and I went to the same university, so <laughs> one year overlap in the university as well. And you went to, to regular old um, public high school, not Lutheran high school, right? I think in one of the biggest high schools in the state, actually, so big high school. Yep. <laughs> And right. out of curiosity, what made him join the cult? Because it's eventually he's going to intrigue you. Um, this is so the oldest or I the can't... middle? Because Theodore's got two older brothers. The oldest one was the one that came back really interested in the, the cult, right? Yeah, I can't. I guess I can't really say exactly what influenced my oldest brother to join the cult. Um, don't really want to speculate on that. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> speculate. Problem. I can just say that, like, he went off to college in the Chicago area. He was basically alone. I don't think any of his friends went to that school. Um, my mom recommended that he go to, might have been some big Christian event put on by Moody or something like that. Um, and he went there, and it's there that the cult people were recruiting. Mm. Um, so he first um, got involved in 
one of those churches in Chicago. And they normally build their churches in more populous areas mm -hmm. so that they can recruit better. Yeah, and I bet, I mean, the reasons anybody joins anything is the same reasons you described why you were impressionable. You felt like when you heard about it that you were missing something um, and that there was more meaningful purposes in life. So that happens to people in college, happens to people like in their coming of age around 14, 15, um, and genuine Christians try to take advantage of those kind of natural life crises um, to get people to think mm. about God. So I'm not surprising that a cult would hit the same mm. And so he and was hit in college and you were hit in eighth grade. Yeah. And he potentially could have been like disillusioned by some of his um, claimed Christian friends. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how Christian they were. And obviously that's a part in uh, what some people say. Like they don't want to be a Christian because they see someone who claims to be a Christian not actually being a Christian. Right. <laughs> Okay, so picking up, um, you start to hear about the cult from your oldest brother, and you're going into high school. How how did that play out? Um, um <laughs> do you want me to pick it on point three or yeah, go off point three? Again? You got a system to this. Okay. <laughs> Um, so the Korean cult was intriguing and agreeable um, to my mind in a topic or two and promised the highest level of word and the highest level of heaven. By the time I was a senior in high school, I thought it was intriguing enough, agreeable enough, and possibly true enough that I joined, which meant attempting to wake up for pre-dawn prayer and Proverbs every day around 3.30 or 4 a.m. at that point. Um, and listening to and taking action on the words preached um, and evangelizing, etc. Um, and in that time, I had like a vague dream or two in there um, that I had interpreted to affirm, I guess, what I was following. That's really interesting. What were the dreams? Do you remember? Oh, the one that comes to mind a little bit, which is still extremely vague <laughs> in my mind, was something involving an eagle um, and buddy who knows me <laughs> knows I like birds and photograph, uh -huh, photographing birds. And I think one of my prayers might have been like something like God show me the right way or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think something related to the cult and like a bald eagle, something were in this dream. So at that time, I obviously just thought, not exactly sure what this means, but it probably just affirms what following. So interesting. And do you remember the second one or is it equally as oh, yeah. interpreted? <laughs> okay. I mean, you never, I mean, the, it might sound dumb from the hindsight of like why you're determined, but that's the kind of things that, that do convince people is dreams like that or others. And as we'll see, there are more interesting or unique, less probable uh, like circumstances that come later. Okay, I'll keep on going. So you're high school, you're getting into it, and now you're like really praying. So you're waking up. You, you said it like we all know what it is, but pre-dawn prayer means before the dawn, you get up and you pray right. with with their leader, the cult leader, or just on your own? Yeah, so he, at this time, he was in jail. Actually, I think for the whole time I was in the, in the cult, he was in jail. Um, but I think some of the time he could... Either he could still record videos and or he just, uh, they replayed uh, recordings mm. that he'd done. Um, they'd have some other pastors like read the Proverbs some of the time because he could still write um, and send letters or Proverbs and then somebody could retrieve them and then like propagate them to the church. So when you say pre-dawn prayer, it was a video with him. And when you say Proverbs, you mean sayings, yeah, it was, sayings from him, the cult leader. Yeah. So it was basically like a complete small service. Hmm. There were, there's a, a music 
<clears throat> singing. Um, and then I get probably it, just prayer, then music singing, and then Proverbs. Okay. Proverbs so that's the, now you're getting like juicy. So you decide you're thinking about like what's true, it's interesting, and now you're doing this stuff. So what happens when you go off to college when people normally become their own men? Yes. Um, so in college, I experienced three significant events, which I attributed as miraculous confirmation that I was walking in the truth. So first was um, freshman year. Um, obviously, you, you get a dorm room, get a dorm mate, um, and there's somebody on uh, somebody whose name was on the door, and I was just thinking, okay, God, um, if I got to do this pre-dawn prayer, how is this going to work <laughs> with a roommate? Um, so I prayed, but I, I don't know what you can do or what I should do, but uh, please do something. Mm -hmm. And so the, the night of move-in day or like one day after move-in day, I get a Facebook message from my would-be roommate saying his mom was in poor health and that he would be staying home for this semester or this year. At that point, I could uh, like purchase or purchase basically rent the whole room mm -hmm. or just still rent my portion. But then at any point in the year, somebody could fill my room or get transferred to my room. And so I did nothing that whole year was alone <laughs> wow. in the room uh -huh. so i thought oh god i didn't know you'd do such a thing but you did it so i saw that as confirmation that i was supposed to be doing pre and prayer following this uh korean jesus and well and it tells you you know we know the end of the story is that you don't happen to the cult but um it tells you that god does allow and bad things to happen, right? In this case, you to continue in pre-dawn prayer for the sake of your eventual testimony and for his glory. So um, he doesn't always do the stuff that we think he's going to do. But in any case, yeah, I, mm. I bet it was providential. Um, everything's providential, but this is providential that you didn't have a roommate. Pun intended. Yeah, pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so the second... Um, second... Uh, significant event was um that my university it's just a small private university associated with the methodist church um in small town ohio the university is basically as big as the town um like three four thousand people <clears throat> and so that school had a sister school in seoul south korea and what do you know? They have a fellowship program where you can study uh, study abroad for 30 days um, at, oh, I'm actually wearing a shirt. <laughs> hey, look at that. Hanyang, Hanyang University. <laughs> um, and so I thought, oh, that's interesting. I could get closer to headquarters or the natural temple, as they call it. And so I just signed up or applied for that fellowship and maybe 20 people get it and I I got it so um, after freshman year I spent 40 days actually in South Korea 30 days was the study abroad um, and on Sundays and whenever I could I went to like the uh, headquarter major church in Seoul, South Korea. Um, okay, and then, you said they call it the Natural Temple? Yeah, so the Natural Temple is like basically the the major retreat center, which is um, where the guy was born, and he's just he just continues like buying land around mm. um, and making it beautiful and such. So I have to stop and, and ask, so... You were in high school and you're in college. Did it ever strike you as weird? Because Korea is pretty obscure. You know, I guess they're more and more influential these days because of like K-pop and whatever else. But like, it's kind of an <laughs> odd group 
to have a cult that goes abroad. Um, although, as as we know, and even as you said in the beginning, South Korea actually has a lot of cults that come abroad. So I guess it's not that weird. But um, I thought the U.S. was supposed to be this core of all cults. You know, aren't we the ones that make up cults and then export them abroad? Did it was. It, did it ever strike you as weird that that it was a South Korean thing, or did that never feel weird to you? Because obviously you're not Korean. No. Yeah, actually, one. <laughs> Of course, I laugh at it now, but one thing in the Bible that they point to is like uh, eagle comes from the east and they obviously say, oh, well, how much more east can you get than Korea? Um, the evil comes from the east? Oh, sorry. The eagle. Eagle, the bird oh, from the, the eagle. east. It's like a, oh, like, what the a verse in the Bible. In <laughs> Why are they saying something. that? It seems counterintuitive. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can think of a few places that are east of Korea, Japan. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm just, I'm just. But then, again, when you think of Jesus and where he came, Bethlehem, uh, nobody saw it as anything special. So when I thought, well, if could the second coming, the second coming could basically happen anywhere. So it didn't really matter to me much. All right. Okay, so you weren't, didn't seem weird that it was Korean. Okay. All right, so you're, you're now in Seoul. Very exotic, by the way. So you've gone from Minnesota to Ohio to Seoul. You've done like a real world traveler jaunt here. And you're in Seoul and you're going to their headquarters, the natural temple, the place of this guy's birth and their like main cult HQ. Uh, yeah. You've, you've got- 30 it. days I studied and then an additional 10 days I was able to stay in around that nat natural temple area and uh my family came over as well so my mom and dad and then uh brother uh both brothers were able to come there as well family vacay to check out the cult <laughs> yeah i guess so for 10 days yeah. all right i was in south korea a total of 40 days <laughs> wow very Look. wildernessy yeah okay um yeah, and so, uh, we went three on like, significant hikes, things. worship in the church. Okay. Um, I was able to play in a volleyball tournament, and I I was better than the average player there because obviously I was a foot taller. <laughs> You're very um, tall. Fun. That's true. <laughs> Playing basketball and yeah, just fun. And so it was a good experience then going to the natural temple and hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> I think we got a little special treatment too because we came from uh, Minnesota, the United States, and the people already knew my oldest brother because he worked there for like one and a half years. Mm, okay. So you were famous. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not famous, just a little more preferential treatment. So at this point, you have been waking up for pre-dawn prayer for a good four years at least now, since high school into college. Tempting, yeah. Yeah, or attempting. <laughs> I did not always succeed. Okay, so every every now and then you're doing it. Um, and now you've gone to headquarters, a little pilgrimage to, to Seoul, Korea. Um, was there any trouble in paradise at this point? Was there any questions that you had in your mind um, post the, the like confirmation dreams you had? I don't think so. I was able to learn from like one of the head lecturers at the headquarter church in mm -hmm. um, Seoul. And actually uh, on the Hanyang University campus, a Christian came up to me and tried to evangelize me. <laughs> really? And then I, it was so strange because I was in the cult at the time and thinking, Oh, you're going to evangelize me because you're a Christian? Well, maybe I'll evangelize you because I'm in Providence. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's just interesting. Well, uh, Korean <laughs> but, Christian, I assume? Right. Yeah. I think he was a legit Korean uh, evangelistic Baptist Presbyterian Christian and something like that. All right. So you said, uh, I'll let you get your third thing in. You said there's three significant events. So you got the no roommate oh, right. in the freshman year. You got the opportunity to go to Seoul. What was the third mm -hmm. one? Yeah. Um, so there's a little rooming confusion um, in uh, Seoul. 
like where I would stay at Hanyang University. Mm -hmm. So originally we went to this one place, but then they said, no, this isn't the right place. It's that place. And we went to that place. And I don't know if we had to turn back to go to the original place again or stay at this place, but nonetheless, I get to my room and there's a name on it again. And I'm like, oh no, I forgot about this. <laughs> but then I remembered, oh, well, I mean, I don't really expect you to do the same thing twice for me, but whatever you will, uh, whatever you want to do, if you... Uh, so you were worried about having please. another roommate, is that what you're saying? So there was I, a roommate on the door, got it. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, that night, went to bed, woke up in the morning, nobody there. It's 30 days, nobody there. Wow. <laughs> so again, <laughs> I had the whole room to myself, even though... Presumably, there's supposed to be somebody else there. Okay. So Which those are your three things. I mean, those, those, those are clearing the path. Um, so this is where we should stop, and I should really flip it to Sebastian, because Sebastian really wants to drill you on the tenets, because okay. I think that's what the audience is also thinking now. I mean, we know you're in the cult. We know they have a cult leader, but like, let's get into like the juicy deets of like what this cult is. What is Providence? What a, what a neat name, Providence. Um, Sebastian, take it away. Yes, tell me, because you know, right now this sounds pretty normal to me, but... By the fact that their leader is in jail, something questionable must have happened. So tell me, yeah, the details. What uh, what is Providence in a nutshell? Um, I guess in a nutshell, it's a splinter. So if you know the Moonies or the um, unit unit no, the Unitarian Church or whatever. Uh huh. So. It, <laughs> There's the Moonies, and then the Unitarian Church might be a splinter. I'm mashing things up. It might be a splinter group from them. Nonetheless, Providence is a splinter group of the Moonies or the Unitarian uh, Church. Okay. So the Moonies are a South Korean cult, a, right? And Unitarians right, are people basically who believe a cult that... that comes out of a cult. Yeah. Okay. So it's a it's and... a daughter cult of the Moonies or mm -hmm. the Unitarians or both. And so they have these 30 principles, okay. and they're almost exact copies from the, pre, the Moonies. Okay. Um, and eventually, so you're supposed to go step by step through those 30 principles and eventually realize that the second coming basically has happened. You're supposed to realize how to interpret the Bible, um, and then eventually... Realize, they really like using the word realize. Um, you're supposed to realize that this guy, uh, Jung Myung Sok, is the second coming, basically. Ah, uh, yes, because the Moonies, Mr. Moon was um, Jesus, right? So this is, you guys are wrong. Um, I can't even pronounce <laughs> Providence's Savior's name, but Min he's Sok. the Messiah. Is that true? Right, so uh, Jung says that basically the head of the Moonies was the John the Baptist of the time period. Ah, so he was okay. basically leading the way, preparing the way for. Um, okay, so Mooney Man was John the Baptist, and the real Jesus Christ has come to Korea, um, which is quite humble, to do what exactly? So there's 30 principles that are borrowed from the Moonies, um, and what's what next? Like, So we got Second Coming of Christ, is a Korean guy is already extremely right. fishy considering, you know, the second coming of Christ should be evident to all and he will kill everybody. So like there's that that he has. Uh -huh. um, so he must have an explanation for what he's doing there and like what you do now. Yeah. How are you saying? And shout out to an SNL episode uh, called G D Jesus Uncrossed. That's basically Jesus coming back and murdering everyone. But no, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Christians don't believe exactly that. But it's <laughs> it's SNL. It's satire. A little funny, but crass. Um, so what they believe is that there are basically three time periods. History repeats itself, but it raises its level each time. So the Jews were like the servant level, slave or servant level, word, time period. And they believe like there's different uh, kind of heavens associated with these as well. Um, and then Christians are in the sun a time period so we receive the salvation of sons 
But then the third final time period is the salvation of brides. So they teach that um, Jung teaches the word necessary for brides of God um, to get to the they got so they got the Mormon thing going on. They've got the the Jews are saved at a telestial level, and then Christians are saved at the um, I'm forgetting the Mormon phrases now. Terrestrial, terrestrial, yes. Yeah. And then there's the celestial, and that's that's yeah. the enlightened, uh, <laughs> um, not the Moonies, but the, the Providence people are getting the ultimate level of heaven. Okay, the bride level, as you said. Mm-hmm. And, and how are they, they not claim the rapture? Oh, sorry. Besides the Jesus <laughs> arriving already. Besides the Korean Jesus. Yes, yes. <laughs> How else are they not Christian? Are they different in the other, uh, other way? I mean, the multiple levels of heaven. So we got multiple levels of heaven, but yet Jesus has returned. What else? Um, they have the 30 principles. Mm-hmm. Are they like upsetting principles? Or are they like... Oh, God-like? they don't believe Jesus is God. I guess that's a huge one. Is that one um, of the 30 principles or is that just the general belief that Jesus is not God? No, I think that that's part of the 30 principles. Oh, okay. Um, there's like a separation there. So they believe in a holy son who they believe is part of the Trinity. Then they believe Jesus is basically just a man whom the holy son indwelled or something like that. Mm. Kind of like the Holy Spirit. Nestorianism question. Yeah, about. this is like true. So Nestorians get a bad rap for for believing this when they really don't. But like, this is Nestorianism, where Jesus was a man possessed, like the the Holy Son is God, but Jesus is not. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's what Providence would believe. So that means I'm gonna gather that the cult leader, who I can't pronounce, he <laughs> he believed he was I'm a regular man song. that was possessed by the Holy Son. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So he was just a regular man, but one day he got possessed. Um, yeah, one day he, I guess, did enough. I think a lot of Korean cults are works-based, um, mm. which maybe, uh, don't call me racist, but I think maybe they're prone to that, given their culture. Mm-hmm. Very dutiful, um, yeah. Right. And... Sorry. <laughs> I drew a mental blank. So one, one day he achieved enlightenment and came up with the fact that he is the Christ, which is always a great right. sign, <laughs> really great sign um, that you've lost right. it. Yeah. So he is the Christ. I assume he was a Mooney prior to being Christ right, Yeah, himself. he was involved in the... Man, why can't I think of it? It's a... I'll look it up, but you can continue to ask me questions. Um, but yeah, he was previously a Mooney okay. for however many years, then uh, called himself the Christ and said, no, it was, I realized this is John the Baptist who was preparing the way for me. I take it that this group is exclusive, meaning like there's no salvation outside of this group? Um, not sure about that. It might be more open to because they believe in like levels of heaven Mm. um i think they're more open to believing like if you're generally good um you'll get an okay area nice of course none of that's in the bible so they believe in continued revelation too i gather uh right yeah obviously jung jung suck can receive god's word anytime he wants you said this guy had Proverbs. Is there like a name for this book that he compiled? Oh man, yeah, he's... I don't know the names of the book, but he's written two or three books at okay. least. Actually, I I was over at my parents the other day and saw one of the books that he wrote on the table and I asked, what is this? And my mom said, oh yeah, your brother gave that to your dad and he read it. And I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> interesting. So we've got... But in my dad's defense, he's also reading a really strange Mennonite book right now. I, he's, he's a prolific reader in his retirement. Okay. Um, he loves reading the Bible and religious stuff, and also, he was previously Mennonite, so there's this interesting book of a Mennonite's memoir, whatever, but... 
Okay. <laughs> so we've got Korean Jesus. We've got um, multiple levels of heaven. We have Nestorianism, like possession <laughs> possession of Jesus. So that's how he became the Christ. Um, I'm guessing workspace too, because you mentioned it. So the way you achieve highest level of heaven is through works of some sort. Right. And interjection. I just found it. It's the Unification Church. Right, which is the Moonies, right? That's the official name of the Moonies? Right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I, just, it, I get that mixed up all the time. But huh. um, yeah, so while I was in it, they were preaching like, I think the rapture happened. They say the rapture happened in 20... Is that? I don't know. Within the past five or ten years. <laughs> okay. And the rapture, said, like every like naked, like, like what kind of rapture? Uh, purely spiritual. Oh. Got a it's kind of thing that you got to see it with your spiritual eyes, or be open, or spiritual enough to um, understand it, witness it. So the rapture, rapture is already like super questionable from scripture, but this is like a super duper questionable version of the rapture where like you weren't there to see it. I'm guessing it stemmed from a false prophecy that the rapture was going to happen in 2012 or whenever this is supposedly happened. And then it didn't. And then they had to be, Oh, it was spiritual. Kind of like the Jehovah's witnesses. Yeah. I think it might've happened on his birthday. He has a birthday in arch, I think. And I think that's when he said the, uh, the rapture happened on his birthday. It was Happy like March birthday. 12 or 14 or 16 or something. Okay. So the rapture happened Six, eight. like when you became Christ, perhaps? Or no? No. No, it was after. I don't know. It was some. It was either some prophecy that he thought was a prophecy in the Bible or um, some self fulfilled thing, I'm guessing. Okay. And so. And what about it? So you said it's some spiritual rapture. How does that play into things? Um, I guess it, my take on it now is that it was just basically another thing to say, have you done enough? Um, like, kept saying, there's a 300 line. It was one year. But then as time goes on, he adds, oh, but there's a 400 line a 500 line there's a 600 line a 700 line so there's these different lines, and then sometimes he gives like things you can uh, analyze about yourself to and see like if you, are you are you doing enough basically to determine what line you might be at and what are these lines the rapture what the heck does 700 well, line even mean like 700 god points think, i think that's also a way it, uh basically determining like your place in heaven mm. so i think kind of within those three realms of heaven i there's different levels so i think if you cross the 300 line then you're definitely in uh, like the celestial heaven as mormons would say um but if you're at the 400 or higher then you're uh extra rewards or a more more prestigious position in that high is there a reason it's level. it's got numbers associated with it like are those god points oh not really Convenient. it's it's just for the sake of saying oh are you at that level or are you only at the mm -hmm. 400 line 400 you could wow. be at the five six or seven hundred line i really don't understand the hundred why is it is hundreds the... i i don't know okay so I don't, it's just <laughs> double zero <laughs> yeah. right it's just a whole number what is their view on the Bible? Do they see it that it's corrupted? Do they see it that it's good and inspired, but it's lesser than his proverbs or writings? How, how do they see the Bible? Um, they see the, well, the thing is they basically butcher the Bible and misinterpret it and line it and whatnot. So they claim to see the Bible, uh, like Mormons, they claim to see it as God's word insofar as it's translated correctly or insofar as you interpret it correctly. Okay. So that ruins it all right there. Um, one interesting thing is that the prophecy in Daniel about 
uh, time times half the time and whatnot. Mm -hmm. This is one of their principles as well. Um, they say in 19, I think 1945 or something, he was born. And then th there's like another number that you add. And then it's 1978, which is when Israel became a country again. Got its sovereignty again or something Yom like Kippur that. Yom Kippur War, right? Okay. And so they point to that. And then if you, so there's the, the last one is the 1335 days. Blessed is, it, blessed is the one who makes it um, to 1335 days and whatever. Yeah. And if you add that to the 1290, then you get to 2023. So blessed is the one who makes it basically to the end of 2023. And I've asked pastors about this, like, oh, is there something going to happen this year? And they just say, uh, maybe we're waiting. Um so I'm really curious to see if something happens, because if it does not, then that will be a blatant false prophecy. Now, if they want, if they want to save themselves, they'll spiritualize it. If obviously nothing happens at the end of the 1335 days or years. So they're like a really. I'm gathering that they're a really disorganized doomsday cult. Is this true? Because they're saying that. The second coming, so this is the end of the days, because here's Jesus again, um, who comes at the end of days, and they're bringing in Daniel prophecies about the end of time with days and times, time, half a time, which are all associated with the, the second coming, the end of days, Armageddon. And so they've somehow placed a rapture um, in like 2012 or whenever, even though nobody saw the rapture happen. So I think ideally the rapture would have actually happened, and then they would be like, it's time, baby, um, but it didn't, so somehow it's spiritual. And now you're saying they have some timer calculated in dubious methods to come up with 2023 to be the date of something that, you know, presumably the end. Is that right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if like at the end of 20, if they're saying just blessed is the one, AKA your level is going to be raised another hundred points. If you can make it to the end of 2023, <laughs> even though your leader is in jail right now okay. and might be convicted for another 10 years. Um, I don't know how they're going to take it. But that's one of those prophecies where it's basically unverifiable, insignificant, because you can do whatever you want with it. Right. And it, it, but it doesn't seem that significant to them either. They're just using it as another prop to incentivize people to, right. to stick around. Okay. Mm -hmm. they're trying so, to use the Bible to any way they can to um, convince themselves of their church or convince others of it. It's numerology, false prophecies, very culty. And if a lot I'm... of this comes from the Moonies anyway, so they're not really branching off too far mm. there. He's adding maybe a few things, but mm. too much. If you happen to recall, why is the current leader in jail? Um, under accusations of different types of attempted rape and sexual mm. uh, abuse. And that's also the same reason, I believe, wh why he was in prison for 10 years from 2008 to 2018. Big yikes, like Mohammed and Joseph Smith. Yeah, it does usually <laughs> come hand in hand with cult leaders. And I assume Providence is saying that um, that it's false, that he did not do these things. Right, that's what they're saying. And I was fine because um, when I was in the cult, uh, I would take their explanations because they'd have some explanations. And they'd say, like, the Korean justice system, it's kind of opposite the Ameri uh, U United States justice system in that they say you're guilty before you're proven in innocent. Whereas here, you're innocent before proven guilty. Mm -hmm. So just like, a, again, different culture, government kind of thing over there. And they'd say like, well, this person recanted their accusation or various other things. So I was I was fine believing what they had to say. Um, okay. I mean, I, a person being in prison, you know, it, can be that they are wrongfully in prison. So, I mean, I get that portion of them, um, but we're saying there's enough stuff for them to convict him twice. 
And in the meantime, while he's in prison, I assume somebody else is in charge of the cult? Ah, uh, yeah, thanks for reminding me. So, recently, what makes it even more interesting is that I've been keeping up with a little bit of news regarding it, and I think, like, originally, um, the cult had 14 lawyers or something, but then they dropped down to seven lawyers, some stepped away, um, they tried to delay the um, court trial or whatever, but then the judge dismissed their, um, whatever that's called. Their motion to delay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and even there are recordings of the second in command saying this guy is guilty of everything that has been accused of him. Mm. And I was like, wow. So I brought this up to one of the pastors, and um, he he still says he believes Jung, Jung Jung Suk. He does not believe the second in command. Um, I'm like, well, like two or three of his second in commands have defected. So it's the same thing jesus compared to joseph smith and jung Myung suk so jesus he has his uh 12 disciples one prophesied fulfilling prophecy is going to betray him in this specific way to die this specific way um the 11 remain with him joseph smith <laughs> uh his um well, okay so jesus there's a uh, um, Al, which ones are the, uh, <laughs> his three closest, uh -huh. Peter, Peter John, John, James. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They remain with him. Um, Joseph Smith's three closest, they deny him, um, at least once in their life. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, Jung, it seems his closest people and some high leaders, they seem to defect as well, which it's, I mean, it's not conclusive, but it's just another point um, of asking, why is that? If they get to witness the Messiah, why are they uh, defecting? And why would God do that as opposed to what God did with Jesus? Right, where the apostles come around, whereas the Mormons had permanent losses and like you're saying, the South Korean cult has permanent losses. Um, it is right. bad luck, yes, when second in commands keep defecting. And what do you mean by defecting? Like coming out and saying it's all fake? Yeah, um, that's what the second in command said. Um, and then there is also a, like the head of their uh, internet database or whatever. Uh, she came out with a multi-page confession um, that she was going to submit to uh, I don't know, the the law, the court. <laughs> prosecutor's defense, or court, yeah. Um, yeah, so it just seems to be falling apart from the inside. So I am really curious uh, what it's going to look like in four or five months. And uh, my last question about the cult, because I want to get back to your specific testimony. And do you have any, actually, I should give you the last word. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Uh, they've got salvation is, is based on works and some of these works involve uh, obviously getting up for free on prayer and uh, pilgrimages, I guess, to the natural temple. Um, what is their, their end time story? Like, are they expecting an eventual war? Do they think that there's never going to be an end and that really we're all aiming for a spiritual heaven? Um, yeah, what's, what's their yeah, take they... on the end? Like, how are you justified before God? When will that happen? At least while I was there, uh, my understanding is that it's all spiritual. Okay. And you'll see how terribly spiritual they think it is if you watch my <laughs> yeah. video on Espresso with Sky interpretations from the creation of the second coming. Because I just use three examples of three basic miracles of Jesus. They spiritualize all of them. Mm -hmm. Which like is walking on the water, turning water into wine, um, and another one or two. 
Yeah, which is very uh, like origin-y. A lot of cults and others will. Um, there's a guy named Origin in the early church that did this too, where they allegorize like basically everything, everything in, the Bible. in the Bible. Oh my yeah. gosh, I can't stand that guy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, so they, they come up with like crazy, basically just to get rid of the Bible because the Bible is pretty plain usually on what it teaches. And so if you don't want to believe what the Bible teaches, you come up with crazy reasons um, why what it clearly says doesn't really mean that. It really means something insane. And so allegorical I mean, there is allegory in the Bible and there are themes in the Bible. So it's not to discount all allegory or all themes that you find in the Old Testament to the New Testament. But typically, if somebody's doing it for everything, they're wrong, which is part of my argument against uh, a millennialist. But that's a totally different conversation and way less serious than uh, <laughs> the South Korean cult. OK, so that's Providence. You were in it for a while. You went to South Korea for 40 days and you come back walk us through how you came out of the cult like what's what's that whole deal <laughs> all right so after college i came home and stayed in my parents basement like any good um college homecomer uh -huh. um, until i found a job or place to live and i thought it was only me and my sibling in the cult in minnesota so i thought i had to evangelize and would need to argue from the bible to convince christians of the korean second coming so um, I prayed more and read the Bible more, and like like the five years prior, I found myself back on the fence of whether it was actually true, and through asking my uh, trusted cult pastors from Chicago and New York City about certain topics and interpretations, eventually uh, being able to ask one of the head pastors, if not the head pastor in the United States from California, over the phone about Jesus' resurrection, um, I came to believe that the cult and the biblical Christ were in conflict. So I came back to the biblical Christianity. And here I am, five years later. So I'm going to guess, like, you came back to, like, how you were raised in Lutheranism. Is that right? Like, you suddenly decided that after talking to some of these people, they weren't trustworthy. Like, how, how did that happen? Wait, what do you mean? So... I think I came back to Lutheranism so much as just like a, ba a mere Christianity or basic Christianity of the Bible is true. Now, what does the Bible actually say? Hmm. Okay. And so, and so you talk to these pastors and you still have conversations with these pastors, it sounds like from New York and elsewhere. Frequently. Um, and they just weren't able to answer your questions. Like how, why did, why did that change your mind? You'd been convinced all yeah, this so, time. Um, at the end of it, uh, I asked my other brother, like, if there's one question that he wants answered, because I was, I was <laughs> kind of like you say with the podcast, I'm the one who finds interesting people. <laughs> uh -huh, you do. Because <laughs> um, I love hearing their perspectives. Um, so I asked my brother, if there's one question, what would you ask about? Um, because I'm going to these pastors, I'm going to get answers. What do you want me to ask? And different uh, parts of it, like, different times I'd make a list of 10 questions or 20 questions that I'd go to one pastor or another pastor and try to get these answers um, but then eventually I took this one question to this possibly the top pastor in the United States and the question was what happened what do you think happened with Jesus's body if it was a spiritual resurrection what happened with his body the answer I received was um, something along the lines of, we like to think that God um, directed the disciples to deal with his body in a proper way. Something like that. And I was like, okay, well, man, the Bible speaks directly against that in two or three places. Hmm. So, yeah, and, and that's an important point because I don't know that it was clear from what we were talking about the cult. They don't believe in our physical resurrection, and so they don't believe that Jesus physically resurrected either. Right. Interesting. So it's very kind of Gnostic y, the physical world. We're trapped in the physical world. Eventually, we will ascend to the spiritual realm. Mm, Manichaeism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so his answer did not satisfy you, huh? Because that's totally against the Bible? Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> So what'd you do? Do you, do you have like a sweaty crisis of faith? Like what, uh, describe that moment for me when you decided that they were liars. Were, was it like a world falling apart kind of thing? Or was it like a, 
Did you always know it internally? How was that? Oh, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, I always know internally. I don't think so. I think I was enough convinced or like more convinced of uh, Providence than Christianity for a time. Hmm. Um, But then when I came out of it, I was just fine as well. I, I was basically just desperate to God to know which one is it? Just give me a little more uh, push one way or the other, or a little more truth to that I can understand, teach me one way or the other. Um, so I always, in a new, it has to be one one or the other. Okay. Um, so I'd be fine giving up one in favor of the other, or giving up the other in favor of the other. So actually just came back to understand Christianity is true. Um, and then actually a little bit after that, um, my mom uh, told me to meet with this interesting, strange, not exactly uh, Lutheran doctrinally sound guy that was uh, was in a Bible study at the Lutheran church. Hmm. She told me to go meet with him because he was kind of different and thought he might be a good transition for me. Uh, like work out my thoughts and things. So uh, he and I got together uh, many Sundays or Sunday, just many early mornings at a local breakfast cafe. Okay. And we would we would talk over things and over breakfast, and that was kind of helpful because mm-hmm. I had a little bit of difficulty with the Lutheran pastor at the. Uh, the beginning like at the end of the cult or maybe beginning to come out of it because mm-hmm. he seemed too rigid in his certain thought thoughts and and probably uh, didn't justify himself very well i'd assume because once you once you're rigid usually you don't have much patience right so uh, i was like oh i i can't really move anywhere with this guy or um, sharpen iron, sharpen iron, or whatever. So, mom, the grace of God, <laughs> got this perfect man <laughs> to meet with me, and it was it was great. We got to talk about literally everything, uh, and cult to Christianity, um, and that helped me further get out and clarify uh, my thoughts. Yeah. So, so here's my like base question then. Um, you were raised Lutheran, uh, got into the cult, came out, were really examining the Bible. Do you think that you were saved prior to being in the cult? And the cult was like like a couple of years of of lapse? Or, like a prodigal son? Yeah, do you think you came um, to Christianity afterwards? Like, when do you think you became a, like, regenerate? Um, I don't really know I can answer that. <laughs> I don't know. Because obviously, uh, when I... Earlier on, I thought I was Christian, Mm -hmm. but I don't know if that was just me being like a uh, not too knowledgeable, but more so young and ignorant of, or just wanting some sort of. I don't know if it was my feelings, desires, intentions, or if it was really the Holy Spirit in me. It's difficult to discern that. Um, I think. I mean, like, I'll, I'll say from the outside in, it seems like you did love God prior to going into the cult, and that the thing that pulled you out of the cult was your your love for God. Like you were asking God, like what's true, and God directed you through the Bible to His truth, which is in the Bible, and that you were kind of put on just hiatus while in the cult for a little bit. Sure. Yeah, and I could agree with that. And one way I'd kind of look at at it. Um, in agreement with that, that if I had not gone through that fire, per se, um, then I'd be totally weak, uh, a weak sauce Christian <laughs> right now, mm-hmm. if I had not gone through that testing period. Yeah, and you know, it makes, I mean, the South Korean cult aspect is pretty unique anyways, 
mm-hmm. um, but even more unique is how I always thought it was unique when I heard your testimony, how like nonchalantly you drop the cult because getting into cult <laughs> is usually very sticky. You know, that's like a very barbed wire kind of thing. Um, and you were just like, oh, it doesn't it doesn't align with the Bible. Bye. <laughs> you so nonchalantly left it. Um, it, oh, it that's sure. so unique. Right. And, and to me, it testifies that you were a Christian the whole time. Like God had you the whole time and he was just walking you through the fire. Like you said, like he walked you through this whole fake cult um, and then got you out of it the other side. Like you were never not going to get out of it. Amen. Thanks for saying that. I like that. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. So where, where would you put yourself today? I mean, I, you don't need the super details, but like, are you, you're attending, I assume regular, I mean, I know I already know on the sake of the audience, you're attending regular churches. Like how, how would you see yourself right now? Myself pretty good. The first church that I joined after the cult was a more charismatic ish Pentecostal ish mm-hmm. kind of church. And that was a great experience. And I got like willingly baptized for the first time. Oh yeah, because you're in that baptized. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and that was a great experience. Um spent a while there and then um spent a little bit going to a church that my parents go to and then now more solidified in a evangelical covenant church um but yeah that's Still where you met me your key. parents i met you through your parents because i went to that um mega mega church around <laughs> here uh, baptist church and uh, i met theodore's dad in a bible study meetup thing and he was like you should really meet my son he loves apologetics and I would describe, I would describe you as somebody who loves apologetics. I think, I don't know if you describe yourself this this theater, but from the outside in, when you're friends, that you, I think you always had it in you, but the whole South Korean cult thing has made you especially skeptical, but in a good way, of claims to truth. And so you don't stop at lines that traditional Christians would either. That's why you've got your opinions on um hell that you do, I think, is because you don't stop at traditional lines. You don't stop with somebody just saying that's the way it is. You you want to find the scriptural backing for why people believe what they do. And so anything that doesn't have express biblical basis, you are extremely skeptical. And you're super persistent, like God-given persistence. Um, I don't know if it's like uh, an endearing autism that we all have, but you like get fixated <laughs> on topics and you and you fight for them. Like it's it's truly a God given gift because I do not pursue the things that you do with the same veracity. But you will will hound people in a good way. Like you hounded the Mormons to grab the Mormon interviews that we've done, and you are constantly searching the internet for like fringe beliefs, which can be dangerous, you know, like because fringe beliefs are fringe for a reason. Um, but you search them to test them against the scriptures and you call the people out. Like you either call them out as false teachers or you bring them on and we interview them. Like we've had several of those now that, that are to varying degrees of success. And so I would say uh, it seems very providential. Again, no pun intended here. That God <laughs> brought you through providence all the while in his hand because it has strengthened that which he already put in you, which is this like total ability, first of all, to connect with people. And somehow you you get big time false teachers and pastors and, and everybody to talk with you for a long time. Um, and you're like insatiably hungry for the truth. So uh, I agree that the fire has refined you there because Sebastian's super curious. Sebastian has all the book knowledge where he's reading all um, people that no one knows about. Yeah, people that no one knows about church history <laughs> and theology. Um, I think I've got the gift of gab, um, but you have like... The, the insatiable curiosity that I don't, and I don't think even Sebastian has that like mm-hmm. kind of like people curiosity that wants to like call people in. So, um, oh no, whenever you say the people you find to like talk to, I was like, what the heck? How do you even find these people? I would never be able to find these people. So, and if you look at the graveyard of faces that we've brought into our tiny little podcast, it's like a local Christian Hindu combiner guy who just, just yeah, he's like, yeah, you guys do a podcast that says that everything I say is fake and then I'm a moronic. <laughs> yeah come on like how'd you even do that <laughs> only by the grace of god did you get that guy on um we got the guy with the total non-traditional views of hell um and everything like that but I mean, not just that like and he was a pastor so it's not like he was a nobody he was he has a busy person that took time of his schedule so well done he came on he said he once pastored the fastest growing church in his denomination whatever yeah, that means methodist thing right um and then we got david alexander who like 
what the heck? I didn't know you got us a big name, but Apologia, like the next week was like, we can't even get this guy on. He refuses to interview <laughs> Calvinists. And I was like, oh, we were those Calvinists. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, so I don't know. You got, you got David Alexander on. Um, the grace of God again. That, that was maybe his first and last. Uh-huh. And but the Mormon Christians. missionaries and, uh, you know, Lord willing, probably other people. So uh, that's how I would round out your testimony. That's where you are today. Better man because you went through all that than uh, had you not. Mm-hmm. Do you have any closing questions, comments, Sebastian? No, I like your story. It is powerful, especially if you're going to share with other people that have had a similar uh, search for truth and they find themselves in other cultic-like groups like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and you can even stretch it out to some fringe Christian denominations that are cultic-like. So I'm just happy to see how God has used you and the best part that I would say is you're very you know, understand that people don't know you based on just the podcast but you're a very reasonable and amicable person which a lot of people that do apologetics for a living can be mean and uh, feisty and rude sometimes but you're none of that so that is also another gift that God is acting in your life that you've had that story you've had that you've gone all through that you've searched for truth but you're also very amicable so praise god for that praise god you got some sharp words online though but don't we all i feel like comments never <laughs> translate to, to things um, i get passionate sometimes you do i like, give you, you sharp words online but so do i like i read some of my own stuff i'm like gosh i was sharp um if it, words if you just speak really straightforwardly in your in your text words it can come up as really non-nuanced um, but we forgive each other so that's how it works <laughs> That's why I would like some of our, our really angry commenters um, or passionate commenters like Eric L. Harb and others who've done whole videos on. Come on, man. Like, like email us at foundcausereal at gmail.com and let's set something up because I think everything would be better in person than it is um, in text. Mm -hmm. Do you have any closing comments, Theodore? Uh, oh, I think I'm good. All right. Well, thank you very much for giving your whole testimony. Thank you all for enduring the setup to it. And hopefully this is useful to anybody listening. That's why we have found our cause in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The real one, not the Korean one, um, the, the everyman one. Uh, I've been Michael the behind the machine. And to my right, your left has been... Sebastian, the bookkeeper. And our special guest and contributor across the airwaves has been... Your under the PC. Thank you for listening. If you want to see the rest of our episodes, you got to go to found foundcause.podbean.com. Not found peace. That's probably some weird <laughs> English thing. Um, that's audio only, though, on Podbean. you got to go to... Uh, youtube or facebook to see our beautiful faces and we're also on spotify and itunes and wherever else you might find your podcast so until next time we talk about something completely different thank you for listening bye <laughs>